So I'm going to share this morning. I must say, I hope there's air conditioning in heaven because if I've got to worship forever in this heat, I don't know about you, I lost weight in those first three songs as it sort of poured off of it. So conscious of the heat, conscious that, you know, people are going to tire and everything else. Let me just share for a few moments. Uh, we've finished the series about back to, back to basics. We're pivoting uh, to something else. So for two or three weeks in that pivot, we have some, uh, a number of subjects uh, that the speakers in themselves individually uh, want to cover. Now, if you remember, Nina reminded us, and I was praying about this three weeks ago, what I was going to share. Nina's words came to mind. Do you remember I said to you two or three messages ago, all of us, and I, 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 let me start with myself. I have one or two parts of my body that I think are ugly. Does anybody have that same fact? Just me? Just me. Okay. Oh, no, there's a handful going up now. I look at certain parts of my body, and they're not rude parts. We're okay. We're all, it's not like a, it's a family service. And I think that's ugly. And in my case, it's my feet. Now, some people's feet are beautiful. Their nails are beautifully cut. The skin and the tone and the arch of their foot, their heels are beautiful. My feet are not. When I, thank you. When, when I go to the beach on holiday, I wear something on my feet. When I'm sunbathing or walking around, I cover my feet. My feet are ugly. Now, of course, Nina came up and said to me afterwards, and then said to me in a message, how beautiful are the feet of him who brings good news? And I felt, I felt quite seriously challenged about that. Because God did create my feet. And I'm referring to the creator that he's made a mistake. Now, I think he has made some errors around my feet, and we will when we get to heaven. I guess we'll have a conversation among a number of conversations around that. But let me read you this scripture, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and you'll recognize, don't turn to it, you'll just recognize these words. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 12, it says this, the body is a unit, though it is made up of many parts, and although all its parts are many, they form one body. And so it is with Christ, for we were all baptized by one spirit into one body, where Jews or Greeks, slave or free, and we were all given the one spirit to drink. Now, the body is not made up of one part, but of many. If the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body, it would not be for that reason cease to be part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I'm an eye, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason cease to be part of the body. If the whole body was an eye, where would the hearing be? If the whole body was an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has arranged the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If they were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, but one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. And the head, in brackets, Phil, cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker, in brackets, ugly, are indispensable. And the parts we think less honorable are what we treat with special honor. Now, all joking to one side, the feet are integral to a body, to any body. Any body as in a gap between those two words, any physical body. Let me hit you with some feet facts, shall I? (laughs) We're going to get serious in a moment, don't worry. Did you know the body, the foot, and the ankle is the most complex engineering structure of any part of your body, including your brain and your heart? You don't look very impressed by that. I want you to be impressed. There's 26 bones in your foot and your ankle, which is 25% of all the bones in your body are in your feet and your ankle. Now you're impressed, right? There are over 33 joints, 100 muscles or ligaments, and interestingly enough, 250,000 sweat glands. I've counted every single one of those, okay? 250,000 sweat glands in your feet. Isn't God impressive? When he says that by evolution, 
through a small molecule crawling out of the sea and joining itself to another molecule and eventually ending up with a human with actually a foot and an ankle that actually has 20, 250,000 sweat glands. What's the hardest to believe, God or luck? Hello? Did you know the pressure you put on your feet and your ankle as you walk through your lifetime, it gives you better comfort than almost a dumper trunk of cement, the weight relative you're putting onto your foot every time you stop. On average, the human will walk 115,000 miles in their lifetime. Not in my case, okay? I'm around 100,000. And there's almost 8,000 nerves. But of course, the, bo- the foot is a key part of a physical body as much as it is of, of course, a spiritual body. We need feet. The head cannot say to the foot, I have no need of you. This complex piece of shock absorbing engineering, in fact, Nina was right, is beautiful. I just got to spend a bit more work on the physical appearance of God's engineering on my feet. But the Bible has something to say about feet. It's what I want to share this morning. Five things I want to say that feet remind us of key spiritual facts, symbols, pictures that I hopefully will encourage us. The Bible is very clear in Proverbs chapter 4. The Bible talks about the feet that need to be on the right path. And the feet need to deliberately be on the right path. Let me read you Proverbs 4 and words you'll recognize in verse 10. It says these words, Listen, my son, accept what I say, and the years of your life will be many. I will guide you in the way of wisdom, lead you along the straight paths. When you walk, your steps will not be hampered. When you run, you will not stumble. Hold on to instruction. Do not let it go. Guard it well, for it is your life. Do not set foot on the path of the wicked or walk in the way of evil men. Avoid it. Do not travel on it. Turn away from it and go on your way. And in verse 26 and 27, the same Proverbs 4, it says this, Make level paths for your feet. Take only the ways that are firm. Do not swerve from the right or the left. Keep your foot from evil. Feet need to be careful where they step. And the Bible is very deliberate, both here and a couple of other verses, I'm going to come to in a moment. We are responsible for where our feet step. Not physically necessarily, but spiritually. When I was very young, my mum particularly had a real hang-up, and excuse the subject for a moment, had a real hang-up on the fact that as children, my brother, my sister rather than me, my sister's only a few years younger than me, we would be very careless walking and playing outside on the streets in which we lived in a place called Chapel Heath near Romford. And unfortunately, sometimes it was true, but she would ask us to check the bottom of our feet before we came into the house. Do you understand what I'm trying to say without me saying too much? And she would make us stand against the door jamb and check our feet. That's okay. Until you're 17 or 18, and you're bringing your mates back to do some games and play and watch TV, and she's making all of your 17 and 18-year-old mates check their feet, much to your desperate embarrassment. But she knew I was not careful where I placed my feet. And bringing that into the house was not a good thing. Our feet and where they step, here in Proverbs it says, we need to take that responsibility. It says deliberately avoiding evil. What does it say when Jesus gave us the model prayer? Lead me not into temptation. I have a friend who is an ex-alcoholic, or most alcoholics will say they never get over it, but he is in recovery. And he says to me, the way I deal with it is I go and stand outside pubs, I smell the drink, it helps me cope. My reaction was, why are you putting yourself in the place of temptation? I don't get the psychology or the theory or the thinking behind that. Lord, you need to help me with addiction to pornography. Stop looking at the sights that lead you to it. Lord, I need to focus on your word. Then why do soap operas dominate your waking hours? Lead us not into temptation. Deliberately place your feet, it says here, away from the paths of wickedness. We have choices. 
Sin is not an accident. Good grief, I've just sinned. We have a responsibility to step away and not be where sin is. As it says here, the paths of wickedness. God will guard our way if we let him. In Proverbs 2 and verse 8, he says these words. For he guards the course of the just. He protects the way or the steps of his faithful ones. God will guard our way if we let him. God will make our paths straight in Proverbs 3 and verse 6. He will straighten the path in which we walk if we allow him. If we will, it says in Proverbs 3, if we will acknowledge him. God will guide our steps in the famous Psalm 23 and verse 3. He will guide our steps morally if we allow him to be our shepherd. In Psalm 119, uh, as I was sharing with Kevin, 105, my favorite verse. Thank you, Bayo. He says, God is a lamp or a light until my feet. God will light our path if we are obedient to his commands. So the first thing I see on feet in the Bible is though the path is narrow. Interesting you brought that word easier earlier, uh, Nina, not knowing what I was speaking about. The path is narrow. The path is difficult. The path is always up for, upwards. But in that narrowness, in that toughness, our feet can stay on the right path if we allow God to guard, straighten, guide, and light our path. And guess whose responsibility that is? Ours. When I was sharing recently about communion, I shared the fact, the idea of the empty chair at the table, the Lord's table, Jesus sitting there waiting for you to take part in the communion. Jesus never moves. When I feel God is far away, when I feel the heavens are as brass, when my feet are straying from the path, I have made that choice. Proverbs is very clear. The second thing I want to bring out is, of course, around feet. A very famous scripture indeed, of course, is the scripture of John 13. It says this, It was just before the Passover feast, and Jesus knew the time would come for him to leave the world and go to his Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he showed them the full extent of his love. The evening meal was being served, and the devil had already prompted Judas, son of Simon, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew what the Father had put all things so Jesus knew that the Father put all things under his power, that he'd come from God and returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. And after that, he poured water in a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with a the towel that was wrapped around him. This famous story, because the feet in the story, the symbol here, is a symbol of humility. You and I know, because this is a well-known set of scriptures, the washing of the feet of the arrival at someone's house was the role of the lowest servant. Jesus did not mind that. Interestingly enough, it's normally done on arrival. So the fact that Jesus got up in the middle of the meal and did it meant that no one had thought to stand up and carry out this act. They're all waiting for each other, but no one had done it. And in the middle of the meal, out of the course of normal events, Jesus stood up wrapped a towel around him and served, he, through humbleness, his disciples. It's interesting, if you read the same, there's not quite the same detail in Luke, but in Luke, in the same time period, they've just come in to have the meal, and just before, there had been this huge argument about who was the greatest disciple. Who was the greatest disciple? Next thing we know, Jesus is washing feet, answering the first question. It doesn't make, need to make it obvious. Do you remember a little while ago, you two had a bit of a Barney about who was going to be the greatest disciple? Let me show you. He just got up and washed the feet. The moment was not lost. Because in his moment of humility, out of the normal order, when no one else had volunteered, he answered the who shall be the greatest argument. The person who is greatest is the humble person. He who's first shall be last. And the second half of that verse, which I always find in my personal life encouraging, he who is last, which is often me, shall be first. I went back for a school reunion last year. Never do this. You find stuff out you never wanted to find out. You look at other people's lives. And I went back to my school reunion. In my school, 
in my class, I was, you know, the slight weird child for obvious reasons. I was the very thin child. I was only six stone, seven stone. I had some sort of medical thing going on. When they did the football pickup in the playground, you know, uh, the two captains, you, you, I was always the last. My capability for sport was zero. I was a geek. I loved learning, so therefore I was slightly ostracized by the class. And also I had, uh, I had quite, quite a bad stammer, so I had difficulties sometimes expressing myself very clearly. School was not necessarily, particularly my younger school, the best place for me. And I used to come home and talk to my parents, and my dad would quote this verse. He who is last shall be first. But right now, dad, I'm last. In front of everybody else, I'm last. Don't you worry, you'll be first. So I went back to my school reunion. And you just go back, and you don't want to show off or anything, and I walked in, and I listened to their stories. I listened to their lives. I listened to their divorces. I listened to their problems. Two of our class are no longer with us, for example. Uh, both, one having died of an accident, one having committed suicide. I listened, I listened, I listened. And not because I think I'm first or not, but the verse had come true. Does that make sense? And it's important for us to recognize the feat of humility is the story of humbleness. Humility, not weakness, is a lifestyle. Humility, not weakness, is a value. In Romans 12 and verse 10, it talks about the fact we need to prefer one another. The word prefer actually comes from the word raise up. Now, we're not going to do this. But if I was to do this in my head, I would say, Dwayne, I'm going to spend the next year raising you up. Raising you up. Praying for you, giving to you, referring you, ringing him up every day, asking what I can do for you, cutting your grub. No, no, okay. Things like this. I'm going to do everything. Because if he does it for Tony, and Tony does it for, guess what happens to the body of Christ? It's raised up. What world do we live in? We live in a world that spends all his time trying to tear down. I'm no apologist to Boris Johnson. I think he's got some serious moral and power and pride problems. But isn't it interesting how destroyed his reputation is? Now, partly self-destruction, I imagine. Quick to put up, quick to tear down. That's our society. I worked for a consultancy many years ago in my younger years, a very famous professional services. And they said in their teaching, this is their teaching, when you get to the top of the pole in this organization, make sure you grease the pole underneath you so no one can get to you. That's the way of the world. I'll just check what the scripture says about the feet of humility. Jesus got up, wrapping the towel around his waist, and he washed their feet. The second part of the Trinity, the man, that, the person that was there at creation, the person who's going to die for my salvation, washed the feet of 12 people. So why is that above me? So we're going to do an exercise now where I'm going to bring forward some water. I'm only joking. Look at your faces. Look at you. Good grief. He's the sort of guy who would do it. Not especially not today. I can't imagine. But metaphorically, why aren't I washing your feet every day? Why aren't you washing my feet every day? Because in humbleness... The feet washing of Jesus is a lesson. Humility is a service to each other. How do you do it? Because in Romans 12, where it talks about referring one another, it starts that chapter with verse 2, by the renewing of your mind. The renewing of my mind enables me to think differently about the world in which I operate. We need to recognize that. We need to understand that. If you've got your Bibles with you, turn if I can find it, into Galatians chapter 5 and verse 13. It reads, it reads these words, 5 and verse 13. You, my brothers, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge a sinful nature. Rather, serve one another in love. The entire law, the entire law, the entire Bible is summed up in this one phrase, this single command. Love your neighbor as yourself. And the word of warning if you keep on biting and devouring each other, watch out or you will destroy each other. Entitled Christians, my rights Christians, false humility, self-centered, slow to understand where the person is coming from, but quick to blame or criticize. 
Jesus set us an example of servant leadership by washing the disciples' feet. Feet demonstrated in this story the subject of humility. Thirdly, the feet of authority. Many times we read about the feet of authority in the Bible. In, in, uh, in Matthew 15, he says they brought the people to Jesus' feet and they were healed. In, in Luke 20, 10 and verse 39, it says that they knelt, uh, sorry, Martha, Mary was at his feet learning his teaching. Feet at the feet of is a sign of authority. The feet of of Jesus was a place of authority. It's a symbolic place of divine authority and power. It's also a place of victory for us. In Hebrews 10 and verse 13, it says, our feet will crush the enemy. You don't look too impressed by that. Your feet, my ugly feet, my spiritual feet will crush the enemy. So why am I not living like that? You know what we should do? Let me tip X that bit of the Bible out. If I'm going to tip X out all the bits of the Bible that I'm not really living, I might have a couple of verses left. Because that's the power that God has given us in the symbol of the feet of authority. In the world, prostrating at the feet of a king in the old days was the sign he had authority over you. And Jesus indeed does have that authority. But it's the sign of our authority over things around us. Authority over ignorance. Authority over sickness. Authority over our enemies. In fact, as it says in Hebrews, authority over all things. What did God say to Joshua after he crossed the Jordan in that special ceremony where they put 12 stones in the dry Jordan to remind them of the journey, the symbolic crossing into the promised land? What did he actually say? Wherever you place your feet, I will give you. That is one amazing level of authority, isn't it? Let me help you. God is saying to you, wherever you place your feet today, tomorrow, this week, this month, this year, if you believe it and exercise the authority, you have it. Those circumstances are waiting for you to exercise your authority. That situation is waiting for you to exercise your authority. That sickness is waiting for you to exercise that authority. That money shortage is waiting for you to exercise the authority given to you. You may never have this, but I often pray to God, and I feel a strong sense by God saying, but I've already answered what's the matter with you. Most of my prayers are answered. The problem is, I don't walk it out. I do not recognize the authority, the feet of authority. We need to live like it. I'm the last two very quickly, and this is the one that I was pushed towards, and rightly so. Feet that bring good news. How can people hear the good news if no one sends them? As it says in Romans 10 and verse 15, quoting Isaiah, how good, how beautiful are the feet of those on the mountain that brings the beautiful message of hope, the good news. But here's the downside of this. The Bible says to us the fields are white, but the harvesters are few. Go out and harvest. It implies effort. It implies us having to go and harvest, us having to reap. The idea of the feet being the carriers of the message is the idea of movement, of journey, of effort, of getting stuck in, of reaping, actively, proactively even. We need to be a proactive witness of Jesus if we're going to fulfill that statement in Isaiah and Romans of having the beautiful feet of the message of the hope of the gospel. It was interesting when Jesus was resurrected, there were four different witness groups, if you remember. Do you remember the resurrection of Jesus? The first group were the soldiers who were guarding the tomb. Do you remember them? And they woke up having slept on the job. They woke up, can you imagine them? 
put yourself in their head, Hollywood here, they're stretching themselves, I can't believe they've fallen asleep, it doesn't matter, no one checks, they've got their money, they wake up, they stretch themselves, they stand up, they shake themselves, plop their helmet on the head, they walk across to the grave just to check everything is okay, and there's no stone there. Flipping holes turned up. And you can imagine, perhaps you've never had this, but all, all of my problems happen in my stomach. Does that make sense? If I'm excited, it's in my stomach. If I feel, I'm, if I feel nervous, it's in my stomach. And I, you can imagine their stomach beginning to fall away. Does that sensation make any sense? I'm, I'm on my own here. But my, I can, this is too much. But my stomach, not, not that fall away. I mean, just as I don't, the sensation. But my stomach begins to churn. That's the better word, churn, churn. Got it. I think it's in Matthew 3, churn. My stomach begins to churn. And the soldiers, as they approach the hole, they stick their head inside. And there's a dawning realization. He is gone. And what's the first thing they do? They're frightened. They're scared. They're therefore able to be paid off rather than you. So the first set of witnesses to Jesus and the good news of Jesus' resurrection, they were frightened. Then you get the Pharisees. What do they do? They bribe everybody and say, Jesus' body's been stolen by his followers. Their version of witnessing is to deny. Deny the facts. And then, of course, we get Thomas. What sort of witness was Thomas? Unless I personally... How rude. How arrogant. Although deep down in my mind, I can see myself here. You probably can't because you're much better Christians than I am. But deep down, I can see this a bit in myself. Unless I put my fingers, unless I thrust my hand. As a a witness, he was a doubt. And then, thank goodness for the women. That's a yes or no. Thank goodness for the women. It wasn't the men who went to the grave first. Those big, brave disciples. Those men who are going to change the world and turn upside down. Peter the rock, he was a pebble right now. The women turned up. Thank goodness for the women. It says they ran to the tomb. They didn't stroll. And they peered inside and came back on fire with the fact that Jesus, bizarrely and amazingly, had fulfilled his own prophecy. He had risen again. Four witnesses to the gospel of Jesus, gospel of Jesus about resurrection and the death of death. The first one, too frightened to do anything about it. The second one, denied it. The third one, doubted it. The fourth one, did what God has asked us to do, got on their feet and ran to the tomb to discover the truth. And it says, not unusual for women, I guess, they told everybody about it. (laughs) Don't don't misread what I'm saying there. Just a slight joke. Because that's what God is calling us to do. The feet that actually share the gospel. And my last one is this, in John 12 and verse 3. A very sober moment in the ministry of Jesus. In John 12 and verse 3, he says these words. Mary took a pint of pure nard, an expensive perfume, And she poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. And then Judas obviously criticized her. And Jesus says in verse 7, leave her alone. It was intended that she should save this perfume for the day of my burial. You'll always have the poor amongst you, but you will not always have me. And my last symbol is the feet. That act of Mary that symbolizes the journey from death to eternal life. It started with Mary here taking pure nard, or skykenard is the uh, the actual perfume, pouring it extravagantly, outrageously, without a care, in front of many people on Jesus' feet. Isn't that just a symbol of love you can't imagine. I'd have measured it. I'd have saved some for another date because it's worth so much money. Without thought, without care, she prepared his feet for his death. What a sobering moment. Jesus, right in the middle of his ministry, was reminded in that instant, in a year or so's time, he was going to suffer the most painful death by a woman breaking perfume 
over his feet. And once you broke it over his feet, he became, obviously through that, almost the anointed one, if you will. It then says in Colossians 2 and verse 14, he was nailed to the cross as a sacrifice for our sin. His hands and his feet. You're getting the clue now, right? His feet. The feet covered in nard oil a year or two before. They were now nailed to the cross. He went from the preparation of death, actually to the death, the salvation, the sacrifice rather. In 1 Corinthians 15 in verse 25, it says because of his death, Death itself is now under his feet. You, you see, the, a little bit of research here, my friends, okay? It's just a little bit of work. We have Jesus' preparation of his feet. We have the nailing of his feet, his sacrifice. We have everything placed under his feet, death. And here in Luke 10 and verse 19, he says, that, and Romans 16, verse 20, sorry, he says, as a result of that, Satan has no authority because Jesus has total authority under his feet. Isn't that incredible? Four feet statements transverse our whole life Christian journey. Preparation, sacrifice, death, resurrection, and our authority. We need to live with that symbol, with that fact Every day, he has gone before us and feet encapsulate our faith story. So my last few moments, I go back to 1 Corinthians in my head. We need feet. We need feet to help us understand the right path. We need feet to help us understand humility. We need feet that help us understand authority. We need feet that help us carry good news. We need feet at the symbol of those feet of Jesus that gives us eternal life and salvation. And without wishing to turn anybody off before their lunch, feet can be compromised. You know that. I was going to show pictures here, but I looked at the pictures last night, and I'm just going to verbally describe it, it turns out. You can get athlete's foot. Have you heard of that? Fungus to the foot. An infection. The feet need to be dried and kept clean. If you have athlete's foot where your life is infected by the things of the world it shouldn't be, you need God to wash and clean and dry your feet so they may be affected. You can get hamatose. That's where a joint is bent, exceptionally painful. It needs surgery. It needs an intervention. Some things in our lives will cripple us forever. They're perhaps even crippling us now. Let God carry out the surgery. You can get blisters that compromise the foot, which is about from friction. You better fitting shoes. Some of us wear shoes, not me personally, obviously, that clearly do not fit us, but they're fashionable. Some of us have tried to be someone we're not. Are you comfortable in your identity In who you are, not in who you think you should be. And of course, another feet compromise is gout, swollen joints. And for that, you need to change your diet. You need to lose some weight. What are we filling our lives with that's the wrong diet that is increasing our spiritual weight rather than increasing our spiritual fitness? We need healthy feet for filling our role in our community. And although slightly frivolously, I've used the feet as a reason to bring out other truths. Do not forget the words here. The feet in the Bible are highly symbolic. The head cannot say to the feet, I do not need you. We need both the feet and the symbol of those feet if we're going to be effective in our faith. Amen.